In the previous episode, we delved into the life and work of Mies van der Rohe, as well as his relationship with architectural colleagues like Gropius. We investigated how they challenged and defined each other within the context of the 20th century architectural avant-garde. We analyzed his innovative approach, his most prominent projects, and how his vision influenced contemporary architecture. Now, we will continue our journey by delving even deeper into the life and work of Mies van der Rohe. Next, let's go with the next. Let's go. We were talking about the modernity and tradition that Mies was involved. Berlage himself, or later on, Le Corbusier, were the ones who brought the gospel of America to the Europe of that time. There's this back and forth between these two poles of creation, essentially Berlin and Chicago, which fuels the early decades of the century. As we mentioned earlier, Mies van der Rohe's journey to Berlin, Germany, to study with Bruno Paul, fundamentally changed the European attitude. Many years later, Mies would recall the 1911 exhibition of his work in Berlin alongside Frank Lloyd Wright's, saying, This changed my life and transformed me into something different, into something we're going to see here. Mies had married a friend of the owner of that first house I showed you. Ada Bruhl was a refined, cultured, and intelligent woman who even had Wolfling, the great art historian, as a previous suitor. This placed Mies in circles where he could better grasp the intellectual atmosphere of the time. After a brief romance, he married her. However, the great drama of World War I occurred. He didn't fight in the war, but was mobilized and spent three of the four or five war years outside of Berlin. With successive permissions during this period, he had his three daughters. Upon returning after the war ended in 1918, the atmosphere in Germany was dramatic. It was a defeated country, trying to understand what had happened. Germany had been the most advanced country in the world technologically, scientifically, industrially, and militarily, yet it had lost the war. For Germans, it was an extreme trauma that elicited all sorts of reactions, sometimes leading to mysticism or a search for Germany's Gothic past. Mies himself gradually changed his way of being in the world. He began to distance himself, and his family started to live separately as he pursued an independent artist's life, frequenting avant-garde circles. Shortly after, in 1921, he definitively separated from his wife and three daughters, embarking on an autonomous life that he maintained until the end of his days. He had other lovers, of whom we will speak, but he never formed or lived with anyone else. He always lived alone in an apartment, choosing this solitude and introspective autonomy as his identity. Yet, during these years of great political, cultural, and ideological ferment, he began to frequent avant-garde circles, where he was seen as somewhat of an oddity because he didn't appear to be entirely avant-garde. However, at the same time, he was viewed and respected as the great artist that he was. Not only did he start to fertilize avant-garde circles, but he also became a key figure in them, especially through some important personalities who returned to Berlin after the war. This created a fertile ground in which Mies soon became a pivotal figure. What you see here is a fair from 1920, where you can already spot Mies van der Rohe with his back turned, participating in the creative world of post-war Germany. Not only was he participating, but he was also financing magazines and taking part in collective exhibitions. This was remarkable considering he was a staunch individualist who never wanted to collaborate and was obsessed with following his own path. Yet, during these years, albeit briefly and some say opportunistically, he cultivated friendships and relationships within avant-garde circles. With little work available due to the harsh post-war conditions, Mies found himself engaging with these circles. What Mies did was to conceive a new architecture through five theoretical projects. When I say theoretical, it means that they never materialized. They exist only as drawings. 
However, these five theoretical projects changed architecture, much like the houses of Frank Lloyd Wright had done 20 years earlier. The first of these projects was a skyscraper that originated from a competition to design a skyscraper on a triangular plot on Friedrichstrasse in Berlin. Mies explored many proposals for this project, studying it in various ways, creating numerous perspectives and photo montages. This is one of them. These are two others. He looked at it from another angle. He wanted to make an all-glass skyscraper. Here, he still sends the plans, but here he began to understand how it was going to be a series of successive floors to which the triangular shape of the plot ultimately gave this somewhat sharpened air of expressionist angles. And this creative effort culminated in the most important drawing of his career. This immense charcoal drawing of a glass skyscraper was made very large to ensure quality when published. It is, in my opinion, the most thrilling piece exhibited by the MoMA during the centenary of his death when they held a commemorative exhibition. The exhibition was somewhat lackluster, but this huge charcoal drawing alone made it worth visiting. Indeed, it symbolized the ferment of renewal that characterized the avant-garde movement at that time. And the other project, the second skyscraper project, because as I mentioned, there were five theoretical projects, but two of them were skyscrapers. This one, a glass skyscraper, features a floor plan filled with curves, as you can see. And this was expressed in the model, where even to emphasize the contrast with the fabric of German cities, a conventional German city was modeled in clay here, showing how this new architecture could be. Indeed, both the glass skyscraper and the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper were perceived at the time as expressionist projects. In fact, many felt that they were in tune with that moment of renewal. When the Bauhaus was founded in 1919, Gropius, in his Declaration of Intentions, illustrated it with this woodcut by Fenninguer, expressing with its sharp angles and rays the dream of a revival through a return to the essence of the German spirit, to that Gothic spirit that fueled architecture, as evoked by many others like Bruno Taut in their works. And the other element, of course, was not just the sharp and pointed angles reminiscent of Gothic towers, but the sinuous and undulating forms. This is a sketch by Mendelssohn for the Einstein Tower from the same year, 1919. They were exploring the artistic way out of Germany's historical catastrophe with this desire to find alternative forms. And the magazine that expressed these concerns, called Frey Leach by Bruno Taut, saw him presenting his own architectures with that crystalline air. He even drew cities of glass high in the Alps, dreaming of another way of being, another way of living. It had something of a reaction, a defense against the crisis of the time, ranging from food rationing to the destruction of part of the industrial fabric, which made Germany a defeated and subjugated nation, further burdened by colossal reparations from Versailles. Bruno Taut, who edited Frey Leach, published Mies's two glass skyscrapers here, saying, Mies has converted to expressionism. He is one of us now. He wants to revive Germany through the magic of glass. However, Mies had another project in mind. He had another agenda. Notice, for example, the drawing he made of the same skyscraper. This glass skyscraper you see here is the same one. The difference is that on the left is a perspective and on the right is an elevation. The elevation shows that it appears to be something dreamy with glass edges, but in essence, it's a succession of planes. It has the rationality of the technique that sooner or later he would achieve in making the glass skyscraper. He drew it the same way and published it like this. In the third issue of a magazine that he not only directed but also financed, he did everything. In this magazine called G, which advocated for elemental forms, Notice how different it is from advocating for abrupt and dynamic forms of expressionism. He said, My glass skyscraper is really like this. This is the elevation. 
It's a rational building. It's an elemental form. It's not a fragment of alpine cliffs and glass. These two were the ones he realized, but he would undertake three more theoretical projects. The third one was the concrete office building, another enormous charcoal drawing of considerable length. He made it enormous for publication as well, where he wanted to convey, this is how buildings should be with this technical rationality. Now, many might look at it and think, well, if there are so many buildings like this, what's so special about it? What's special is that many buildings like this exist because this drawing envisioned how buildings should be. Most of them originate from this charcoal drawing. Here again, he contrasted it with the forms of the traditional city, these forms filled with decoration, cornices, and volutes to say, this is the new world. And he also used it as an illustration in the first issue of his magazine, G, his manifesto, one of the few texts we know of him, which he signed here, Mies van der Rohe, stating how the office building is a house of work, of organization, of clarity, of economy, a small manifesto of how architecture will be in the new times. At this point, Mies not only had separated from his wife and begun to live the independent life of a bohemian artist, but also changed his name, somewhat like Frank Lloyd Wright, who dropped Frank Lincoln Wright and became Frank Lloyd Wright. Incorporating his mother's maiden name into his own, as he was called Maria Ludwig Michael Mies before, he dropped Maria and Michael, keeping Ludwig and adding his father's surname Mies with his mother's Roe, united by Van Der, somewhat aristocratic Dutch particles. As he was born near the Netherlands, he thought they suited well. Thus, Ludwig Mies became Mies van der Rohe. With this artistic name, he has come down to us. Similar to Wright, incorporating his mother's surname, although Mies's mother was not as significant in his life as Wright's was in his. Nevertheless, it's important that he started making manifestos, wanting to influence the world around him. The fourth of the theoretical projects is the concrete country house. I understand that you might look at this and wonder, well, what's so artistic about it? Because this is important, you know. Here's a model of it. I can understand the perplexity of many because, just like Wright, it immediately fascinates, seduces. It has that ability to empathize. It's not so dry, so rough that one might say, what's so special about this? However, this kind of turbine organization, these elongated windows, would become the Esperanto of modern architecture. He used it in the second issue of the G magazine as material for elemental forms. He used it to illustrate another manifesto of the same kind. And finally, the most lyrical. And the most challenging of all theoretical projects, the brick country house, which the elevation doesn't say much about, but the plan is dazzling. It's almost an ideogram of modern architecture because what Wright attempted some time ago, which was to break the box, has now been completely shattered. Architecture is no longer about boxes. It's just a series of planes that shape spaces. Space flows between them, and ultimately, the walls extend indefinitely into the countryside. It's a neoplastic diagram that, of course, comes from right through Dutch neoplasticism, where he managed to merge ideas of artistic and two-dimensional character. From Van Doesburg, who founded neoplasticism with paintings like this one and then what the Russians were doing. The Browns of Lisiski gave them an architectural life, fed by the plastic arts to change architecture. Of course, the magazine G was extremely important for the Russian constructivists. They wanted their organ in Berlin to be G. The Dutch neoplastic movement valued Mies so much that when they exhibited in 1923 in Paris, everyone was Dutch except for Mies. Mies was the only non-Dutch person they included in their exhibition. That's why they consider him one of them, regardless of his name being Vander, which helps, and having been born on the edge in the Drake Landerek on the edge of it.
At that time, his colleague, comrade, and rival Gropius was directing the Bauhaus. But look at the atmosphere of the moment. Gropius had a version of the riddle lamp in the Bauhaus in Baymar. It's almost a manifesto of neoplasticism that we saw before, placed on top. And when the time came for the Bauhaus to build a new headquarters, in Desso, logically designed by Gropius, notice what Gropius did. He used the turbine organization and horizontal bands that Mies van der Rohe had already implemented in the concrete country house. That model I mentioned earlier, which probably didn't impress you much. Well, that model is the origin of this great building that would go down in history not only for its quality, that kind of stripping away of any ornamentation, but also for having been the headquarters of the most influential modern school in history at that time. And to see the difference with Mies, in the same year that Gropius was designing the Bauhaus headquarters, Mies was pursuing an independent career. He devoted himself to working simultaneously for art-loving magnates with extraordinary houses, and at the same time as a somewhat left-leaning individual who had connections for social housing projects at that time, houses for workers. It's very interesting to compare Gropius's Bauhaus with its white, somewhat nautical appearance, an architecture drawing its ideas from ships or locomotives with Mises's Wolf House. This is the first house he built after the long drought caused by the war and post-war hardships, after many years without construction. What makes it special? Firstly, it features an articulated floor plan similar to his brick house, combining elements derived from constructivism with neoplastic compositions pioneered by the De Steel movement in the Netherlands. Additionally, it is entirely constructed using bricks. Brick, which was a material considered taboo by modernists, as it symbolized tradition. Hence, brick meant forbidden. All had bright white surfaces. However, Mies said, no, brick can be modern. He created a Dutch brick that honored his admiration for Berlage's tradition. He built this house, which became quite popular in the area where it unfortunately stood. Later, during World War II, it was so heavily damaged by bombings that it had to be demolished. But during its existence, it served as a tourist attraction for the locality where it was located. And indeed, the way the terraces... Truth of planting merges with the rough brick, a truth of that coronation Mies made. Without a doubt, it gave it an almost land art aspect, a sculpture in the landscape, an extraordinary integration, which is what Mies always sought. His works have that rationality, let's say, platonic, that could be placed anywhere else. And yet they land in the place, you know, and they engage with it until they merge and become one. And here we don't distinguish the difference between the house and the landscape. They have become one. That house is also the beginning of a long friendship of Mies with a very important person in his life, Lily Reich, who was his lover until he departed for America. She was a very good interior designer, a very refined woman. The owner of the house, besides being an art collector, was a textile merchant. She had worked extensively in the textile world, as a designer, as an interior decorator. She furnished the house. Mies met her here, and from then on, Lily Reich will appear many times in our story because she also changed Mies's way of thinking. Mies, despite being conservative, was a man who never had very evident ideological convictions, but at this moment, he allowed himself to be carried away by the times. He was the president of the November Group, a group of architects named after the Spartacist uprising of 1919, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, which failed and both were executed. So, he was the president of the November Group, and a friend of his, a communist intellectual, asked him to create this famous monument. To Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, the heroes of this communist uprising in the Germany laid low in 1919. So you see, 
He undertook the task of making a monument with an almost anti-monumental spirit. Just some brick masonry, recycled brick, a clinker, you know, very rough, very coarse, but maclaimed as in the wolf house, you know, to give that image of geometric abstraction. Monument, what does it have? Well, it has the audio and the hammer inside a star. It has a flagpole. But essentially what he proposes is something that is at the same time. At the same time, yes, a tribune because on it, speeches would be given. And at the same time, the wall against which they shot Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. And that would be the inauguration. And this is the moment of greatest harmony of me van der Rohe with this communist vanguard, which was so deeply rooted in the German intellect of that time. In this chapter, we've delved into a crucial period in the life and work of Mies van der Rohe, from his transformation after World War I to his involvement in avant-garde movements and his relationship with figures like Lili Reich. Mies challenged conventions by using traditional materials innovatively, such as brick in his country house, and embraced a rational and abstract architecture. Additionally, we highlighted his proximity to political movements like communism, evidenced in his design of an anti-monumental monument honoring communist leaders. This chapter unveils the complex relationship between Mies and his cultural and ideological environment, setting the stage for further exploration of his legacy in the subsequent episodes. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the life and work of Mies van der Rohe. In this chapter, we've uncovered pivotal moments in his career, from his innovative architectural projects to his engagement with political and cultural movements of his time. Stay tuned for more insights and revelations in the next episode as we continue to explore the legacy of this architectural icon. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content on architecture and design. Until next time.